Hi there. My name's Kyle, and I am not an alcoholic. But I was. I actually struggled with many addictions in my life. At the age of 14, I began smoking cigarettes. At 15, I began using marijuana. At 16, I began drinking and using cocaine. And at 17, I found ecstasy. By the age of 18, I was fully aware of how to operate the pleasure center in my brain. And my addictive personality, mixed with the availability of substances, was beginning to set my life on a very destructive path. Originally from out west, I moved to Pennsylvania after high school to meet my father and rekindle that relationship. Well, after all the warm and fuzzy feelings fell away, I went back into my old way of life. In addition to my personality, my genetics, and my environment, I've also worked in restaurants and bars for over a decade. And whether it's the money, the hours, or the culture, it's unfortunately an industry that breeds substance abuse. Actually, the service industry has the third highest substance abuse rate in the country, just behind mining and construction. And surprisingly, fourth is the arts and entertainment industry. So it's not uncommon when you work in a bar or restaurant that after a long shift, everyone would go out bar hopping and end up at someone's house drinking until four or five in the morning. And then the next day, we'd all stumble into work like with awful hangovers, I mean, zombie apocalypse hangovers, <laughs> saying things like, that was my last drink, or I'm never drinking again, only to be right back at the bar that evening, unable to socialize without substances. Many of my friends and I would try to give up drinking for a month or, or just a few weeks with no success. So after years of parties and drugs and broken relationships, I began to realize that I had a problem and I was unable to fix it. However, I did say that I'm not an alcoholic, and that's true. I actually haven't had a drink in 598 days, 9 hours, 53 minutes, and 47 seconds, but who's counting? Thank you. That's because on January 21st, 2015, I decided to give up caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine for 30 days. All on the same day while still working at a bar. <laughs> no, I do not recommend you try this at home. But if you are someone who struggles with addiction and you want to know how I was able to accomplish this, then I'll tell you that my solution, what enabled me to get sober, was my relationship with Jesus. He broke my chains, he set me free from my addictions, and even removed the desire to use. Now, I know that there are many different paths to recovery, but in the spirit of authenticity, I can only share what worked for me and that was God. And by His grace, through prayer, journaling, and a community that supported me, I haven't had any drugs or alcohol since. But what I wanted to talk about today was not necessarily how I got sober, as much as what I learned through getting sober. You see, the problem wasn't necessarily that I couldn't say no to substances, although that was a problem. The real issue I was facing is that I was unable to maintain healthy relationships and experience deep human connection. And this lack of connection to the people around me only pushed me deeper into my isolation and my addiction. Johan Hari recently gave a TED Talk titled, Everything You Think You Know About Addiction Is Wrong. In this talk, he described a series of experiments in the 20th century on rats, where they would place a rat in a cage with two water bottles, one just plain water, the other a mixture of heroin and cocaine. And every time, the rat would overdose and kill itself with the drug water. However, a man by the name of Bruce Alexander introduced a new element to the experiment called Rat Park. And Rat Park was the same experiment with the same two water bottles, except for it was a much larger cage with cheese, tunnels, and multitudes of rats. And the fascinating thing about Rat Park is that none of the rats in Rat Park used the drug water. Johann Hari concludes his talk by saying, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. Our culture is a culture of excessive consumption. And when you combine that with the overabundance and availability of substances, what we're left with is people and relationships that are dependent on substances for socialization, ultimately preventing us from learning how to lower our own inhibitions and ultimately limiting our ability to connect. 
This has produced a pattern of high consumption but minimal connection. It's produced an attitude of, I want to have my cake and eat it too, and I want it to be gluten-free. <laughs> the media is constantly reinforcing this idea in TV and advertisements. Some of our favorite Super Bowl commercials are about habitual drinking as a primary means of socialization. In our pursuit of happiness, we've neglected the path that leads to joy. We see this when we go out. Many relationships have taken a back seat to the need to constantly be stimulated. When we go out with friends and everyone stares at their smartphones. When you go to a baby shower and the only person not drinking is the person you came to celebrate. Many bars offer dollar drinks or dollar shots to attract college kids. I find that fascinating because I can't get a dollar drink at 7-Eleven on my way to work. And our children are learning to glorify substances by how much emphasis we place on them at all of our social functions. They see us and they learn that that's how we interact. That's how we have fun. That's how we connect. Or worse, we exclude them from our places of socialization because we don't want them to impede on our liberties. And they learn the cold comfort of entertainment and isolation. Now, I want to be clear that I'm not attacking alcohol or people who drink. There are many people who can drink and enjoy substances with celebration and maintain healthy relationships and enjoy the community they find at the bar. Alcohol is not the problem. Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding in Galilee. Substances aren't the issue. The issue is how much pressure there is to constantly be leaning on them in our culture. And living in a society that is continually pushing substances on us at all times is going to increase the likelihood of people who become addicted or dependent and ultimately going to limit how much we can connect with each other. Another thing that's been revealed to me on my journey is that there are actually many people groups who are becoming segregated from our places of community because of this promotion. For instance, vegan CrossFitters. Or is it CrossFitting vegans? <laughs> I'm not sure which one comes first, but many people who care about health and fitness are turning away from substances. What about people of different belief systems who practice abstinence or moderation? Christians? Muslims? Buddhists? What about those who are under 21 years old? It's a very interesting thing in our culture. When you turn 18, we practically give you a license to do whatever you want. But then we give you nothing to do. Well, you're not going to bed at 9.30. So your options are the cafe or bowling alley that closes at 10, the diner, a fake ID, or the campus party where things like heroin and sexual assault are becoming more and more normal. Did you know that one out of every 10 Americans struggles with addiction? That's 25 million people. That's one person per row. 88,000 people die a year from alcohol-related incidents, making it the fourth most preventable cause of death. So when we're all out enjoying the social atmosphere and fun to be had in our communities, there are many people fighting a very real battle with addiction and exclusion. At night when we're singing and dancing and mingling, there are many people staring at their wall wondering, why am I different? Why am I alone? And what's stopping me from relapsing? And you may be tempted to think that this promotion of substances in our culture is limited to the nightlife and the bar alone. But the promotion of substances has actually gone beyond the normal areas of convenience, such as gas stations or grocery stores. Many places that were known for not having substances are beginning to offer alcohol like movie theaters. Now, I don't know about you, but if I need a few drinks to get through a movie, I'm probably not going to pay to see that movie. <laughs> what about gyms and yoga studios offering alcohol and wine? And many 5Ks are offering beer at the finish line. Now, I'm not a health freak or a doctor, but that just seems kind of counterproductive to me. Many churches are having beer-tasting Bible sessions. Libraries like Barnes & Noble, Starbucks, Burger King, Target, Chuck E. Cheese, at some locations, is offering alcohol to adults. What's next? Daycares that give you mimosas to help take off the edge of the morning after you drop off your kids? So what's the solution? Well, my idea we're spreading is simple. It's to create places and spaces in the community, especially in the nightlife, that are free from the temptation of drugs and alcohol. 
Places that want to facilitate connection as their primary goal. Places that want to see people accepted, not addicted. Empowered, not imprisoned. Places that hold to the idea that we don't need substances to enjoy one another. Did I mention I got sober while working at a bar? <laughs> I actually got sober while working at a bar and putting together a plan to open a sober bar or a bar without alcohol. A place where one could go at night and enjoy live entertainment and music and food and, and meet people and maybe even find safe tra transportation home if they found themselves in a tight spot after the bars closed. Well, after I got sober, I spent all of 2015 telling people about this sober bar idea. And people would commend the need that it was going to meet or they would laugh at how ludicrous it seemed. Well, it turns out it wasn't as unrealistic as some had thought. In 2013, a man by the name of Chris Reed, who was an ex-heroin addict, opened a place called The Other Side Bar in Crystal Lake, Illinois. And this is a place that you could play pool and listen to a DJ and hang out with your friends on the weekends, free from the temptation to use substances. Around the same time, a place called Brillig Dry Bar opened in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was a once-a-month pop-up event where they would have game night and different attractive events for people in their community. There also seemed to be a trend in the UK of sober-themed establishments, one in particular called Redemption Bar, and their focus was on a vegan menu and delicious mocktails. And their slogan was, a night you'll remember. <laughs> I like that. So after all this research, I realized that I hadn't invented the wheel. But I decided to continue. I was too passionate to give up on this dream. And before you know it, Sober Bars was born, an organization that promotes substance-free living in the communities through events and the development of bars without alcohol. We were featured in the paper a few times and started to receive emails from all over the state, all over the country, and even all over the world. Many of these emails were people in long-term recovery who were encouraged by what we were trying to accomplish. Some of the emails were people who had lost loved ones and had wished that something like this existed in their neighborhoods just a few years sooner. It was clear that we had struck a chord in the hearts of people around the world. Everyone had agreed that there seems to be an overwhelming promotion of substance abuse in our cultures, and it seems to be geared towards our youth and in the evening. They agreed that we don't necessarily need to do away with the current system, but we need to provide an alternative, another option for people. They agreed that we needed to create places that were focused on connection and relationships. As we begin to multiply these type of alternative places like sober bars in our communities, we're going to see people who are empowered to live life substance-free. We're going to see relationships that aren't dependent on substances. We're going to see stronger families and stronger communities. On day 30 of being sober, one of my friends asked me, hey, you want to go out and celebrate? And I looked at him and he said, what? How long were you going to do this no drinking thing? And I said, I'm not sure but my life is significantly better. My energy levels are higher, my confidence is stronger, my relationships are deeper. I'm able to have impact in the community. There's people who look up to me. Why would I trade that in? Well, I did go to the bar that night, but I didn't drink. It was karaoke night, and I remember learning a very valuable lesson. I remembered learning that listening to someone who is completely tone deaf, saying Don't Stop Believing by Journey, is just as entertaining sober as it is drunk. <laughs> In fact, it was better because the next morning I had no regrets. I've learned that courage doesn't come from a bottle and that life is wonderful and an adventure just the way it is. Gandhi once said, be the change you wish to see in the world. We must first acknowledge that we have the ability to change. And then we must acknowledge that as we change, the world around us is going to change as well. And as we do this, others will be empowered to do the same. I've found power in the ability to lower my own inhibitions. Let's remind each other, in a culture that continually tells us that we need more, that we need substances or a special drug or a special pill to tolerate, endure, or enjoy one another, let's remind us Let's remind each other with our actions that that's not true. Let's remind each other that we are fascinating works of art, that we are awesome and wonderfully made. Let's trade in dollar shots for heartfelt talks. Let's stop asking our dates what they drink and ask them what they think. 
Let's remind each other that the buzz doesn't come from the product, but from the people. We are the buzz. So go and be the buzz. Thank you.